but uh, it is 802. And so I, you know, we're going to kick things off here and thank you everybody for joining us this morning. I am really looking forward to this conversation with Greg and Shane, a um, couple of gentlemen I've come to know over the past few weeks and prepping for this. And Shane has joined us previously on a, a conversation about the future of learning. And uh, you're going to be in for some great insights from these two gentlemen today. So thank you for that. I will pop their LinkedIn profiles in the chat if you do. If you're not already connected, I'm sure they would love to connect with you. But before we get going, we do like to recognize and say um, the fact that we are on the traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy. Uh, today, that area encompasses the Indigenous people of Treaty 7, uh, region in southern Alberta, which include the Siksika, the Pekine, the Kainai, the Satina, and the Stony Nakoda First Nations, including the Chiniki, Bearspaw, and Wesley First Nations. The city of Calgary is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3, and we encourage everybody to take a moment to, you know, recognize the history that has preceded us here. So thank you for that, and welcome this morning. Um, again, here today to talk about a practical approach to learning and development. And I am very excited to have Shane Anderson, who is the director of Global Talent. Sorry, Shane, I uh, Global Talent and Organizational Development at Stantec. I think I got that right. Um, yeah, something popped in the chat and took my note away. And <laughs> and uh, and Greg Hallsworth, Manager of Talent Management at Interpipeline. And I will just pop their information in the chat. And, uh, you know, Greg, why don't I just quick pop to you for, you know, the 20, 30 second version of how you came to be with us here today, and then we'll go right to Shane on that. Sure. Well, I've been working in the learning space ever since I really joined HR in 2005, which is a lot longer than I realize when I say the words out loud, but um, I, I fell into it quite by accident in, in that uh, prior to getting into HR and the learning team at another company at the Interpipeline. Um, I realized I really loved helping people learn. And it was through that passion of adult education that I, I came to try different tactics and, 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 and see the evolution of learning happen over the last nearly 20 years. And um, it is still one of the things that I love dearest is that, that adult education, helping people, helping people learn and get better, becoming better versions of themselves. Excellent. Thank you. Shane. Uh, yeah, well, uh, welcome to everybody. Glad to see you. Um, I'm Shane Anderson. I'm the Director for Global Learning and Organizational Development at Stantec, which is a international um, top tier uh, architecture and engineering firm. So I've, I've moved into the consulting world, which has really uh, been a fascinating challenge and something that's amazing. Um, much like Greg, I sort of fell into this. He and I both have backgrounds that are outside of the discipline of HR. Mm -hmm. uh, so I actually come from the performing arts world as a theater director and designer and technician. That was my sort of first trade. Uh, practiced that for a while in Toronto and then uh, came back to Calgary and grew up professionally at WestJet. Uh, spent 13 years there learning, experimenting and doing all kinds of really uh, awesome things. Uh, and then made a decision that I question to this day to leave WestJet and go work for Greg. And got to do that for uh, a couple of years, actually, through a couple of different organizations, which was a wonderful journey. Mm -hmm. um, and I jest, but you will learn uh, quickly, as I did, that uh, Greg is a font of knowledge when it comes to uh, all of these things. And listen to him more than me for 100%. Oh, I don't think so. 100%. Fantastic. And folks, I think you can appreciate why we were having a few chuckles before we uh, started this morning. This this is a, uh, uh, these two gentlemen are a, a tight group and I am uh, I feel fortunate to, uh, to have them here today. Uh, the one thing I will say on a, on a serious note, uh, and not to poke fun at it, but we recognize that, uh, you know, we're a very homogenous group speaking to you today. And uh, one of the things that makes our conversations come alive on in, in these webinars either are the perspectives that come in through the chat and through the q a so please uh do not hesitate if uh if you think we're coming at this from a uh narrower lens than you you would like to suggest uh don't hesitate to question challenge throw your thoughts in the chat if you do have a specific question please encourage you to try and put it into the Q&A section. So when you see my eyes darting around here, I'm watching the chat and the Q&A and I, I will continue to do that as, as we go through. But 
please do bring your thoughts, bring your, your comments. Uh, the diversity of perspective is really important to us. So, yeah. um, so we want to talk about a practical approach to L&D. I don't think we're going to spend a lot of time necessarily defining the word practical, um, but maybe we can start this conversation, gentlemen, from the perspective of the opposite. So where do organizations go wrong, in your opinion, or where have you seen organizations make learning and development, you know, far more complex than it needs to be, or more complicated than it needs to be? So maybe we can start there. Let's talk about what's not practical, and then we can stand kind of see where that takes us as our conversation tree. Yeah, I, I think one of the the sort of baseline sins that we as practitioners sometimes uh, get ourselves into is we approach, we, we like to approach this from a lens of we know what great looks like. We, we know the research, we know the adult education principles, we know all of these things that we get very tied to incorporating all of the levels of them in the way that we know they can be done eventually. And something that uh, I certainly have learned over my journey and uh, particularly in joining an organization that is client facing where we are, we're no longer doing the work just for ourselves. We actually are then from a consulting lens, we're beholden to our clients and serving them and doing what's right for them. Uh, it's being able to look at all of that inspiration and look at it as inspiration about the adult, adult education principles, about evaluating learning, about all of those things that I know folks on the, on the call will be well familiar with. And it's being able to say, okay, so what is the fit for purpose version of that for my organization today? That's, I think, what we're drawing the lens of practicality towards is it needs to fit for the constraints that you have. It needs to fit for the organizational maturity, for the organizational pace, for, um, you know, I, I've, I've seen a spectrum of organizations from ones that very much are founded on the learning and development of their people is a key differentiator and you watch that and it actually happens. And I've been in organizations that say that because you have to, but don't practice it. And so you would do, you, you would have to by its very nature, take two different approaches to those differing organizations. And I think that's where we can sometimes get a bit impractical is we don't recognize or don't want to recognize where our organization is at because we believe well we know that people are our greatest asset you hear that from every company on the planet we know that if people aren't growing and developing they're leaving we know that um you know all of these pieces are there but what we don't sometimes take into account is this might be totally the right thing to do but what's the version of that that can play in my organization with its current state yeah, I, I, I like the way you started that, Shane. Um, I, I was taking notes just to make sure that I can capture it and add to what you're, what, you're, what you're starting with. Too much, too quickly, remembering there's a learning curve, right? And as you talk about uh, work towards best practices, I think that's probably one of the key lessons there for me, certainly, is we know what great looks like, right? Shane's right. We, we do know. Um, and, and sometimes we get so excited about wanting to make sure that everyone that we interact with can also know all the great things that we do. <laughs> I think it can be overwhelming. And uh, I don't think we appreciate enough that if you think about a classic learning curve, right? The stuff that I want to talk about and teach, I started learning a long time ago and have internalized it and can speak to it with a certain fluency. And it's going to take other people who I share that with their length of time to also understand, internalize, and be able to speak to it with a degree of fluency. Um, and, and it's that patience with that learning process and that intake and that synthesize synth that word. Synthesis. Yeah. Synthesis. I never believe I used to work for CBC. Um, synthesizing, there we go. Um, that, that we got to remember takes time and patience is not something that we're all particularly good at. My, and I'm pointing myself in that one. To that, I would add a couple more things. I think sustainability, we need to always remember it's, it, you can launch at any amount of programming, right? It, it, there's always going to be the next shiny new thing. For me, the key to resilience, there's not a good word, resilience, is how do we want to sustain whatever programming we introduce if it's meant to be more than once and done? How are we going to sustain that? And what resources do we have? What budget do we have? What commitment do we have? What effort would it take to refresh content? Because thinking can shift over time on some topics. And how do we want to make sure that 
if there's a new practice, say around performance management, or you know, for example, that emerges, uh, again, how can we then update the materials in as painless a fashion, or when the organizational or uh, focus changes, you know, sometimes annually, sometimes within a year, sometimes over a longer period of time. Again, we have to have that 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 rigor to make sure whatever it is that we develop and launch and 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 nurture stays relevant, and that means the not exciting stuff of going in to do an audit review and making sure that we track all the things we need to track. The, the last thing I would add to that first question is um, a, a build on what you talked about, Shane. Um, and I, I, I say it like this, is that ideas can transfer from one organization to the next. Absolutely. Programming cannot. I have made every mistake there is to make and I'm still making them. But uh, hopefully if I'm patient with myself and reflect and learn on them, that's when you come to see some of these insights, is that the ideas transfer programming cannot. I've made that mistake of trying to replicate exact programming as I go from one organization to the next, only to question, why did it fail? It was so successful elsewhere. Why did it fail here? And it wasn't until I realized all the conditions I just talked about are different from organization to organization. So I think it's on us as, as practitioners to understand what are the conditions in my organization? What is going to be sustainable? And if you happen to change organizations throughout your career, certainly lots of us have and do, keep those ideas near, but understand that programming needs to be unique to each organization. It's, it's interesting the way you say that, Greg, because what it causes me to think about is, so my daughter's really into biology now. That's her whole like real sort of raison d'etre at the moment. And what I love there is there's two pieces that come up that I think are phrases that I, I constantly reflect on. And the first one is, anything is poison in the right dose, even water, right? So something that we need to live, we need to sustain ourselves, if overdone, will actually harm in this metaphor, the organization, right? And so you can have something that was a program or a practice that works in a lot of different places. But if you double, triple, quadruple down on that, which we tend to sometimes do as practitioners, like, ooh, this worked, let's do lots more of that. But it's gauging at what point is this uh, helping the organization? At what point is it, is it giving to the organization? At what point are we tipping over to the place where it's actually fatiguing the organization? Because I think given the environments we find ourselves in with such rapid change and, and all of our organizations are needing to meet shifting demands. We're on quicksand in a lot of cases, mm -hmm. right? Whether it be client demands are shifting, industry demands are shifting, regulatory demands are shifting. All these things are moving all over the place, right? And so, you know, what worked yesterday may not work tomorrow, it, or it might, you know, the, that's the whole thing. It's a, it's a bit of a dice toss, right? And the second one was when, it, when you were describing that, what came to mind for me is programming in a way or approaches almost have a, a type, much like there's a blood type. And sure, elements of that from one organization to the other, you actually might translate that over and it fits reasonably well with just some tweaking and change the logo and off you go, right? But I think there's some rejection that can happen if you try to take from one organization that has a different type than another organization. And it can react in a way that you may not have anticipated. Because like you said, you think, oh, but this worked so well over here. Mm -hmm. And it may not be because the approaches aren't sound. It's not because we're not putting good thought into them. It's because the organization itself has a different blood type, yeah. right? And so no matter how well that worked in a previous place, it's reflecting on the fact that it may very well just not be the right type for the other organization. Yeah, and I, from just as an, I, you know, I'm not an L&D practitioner either. I, I came from this from a very different perspective. I wasn't uh, a WestJetter, uh, but I spent 17 years in pharmaceuticals mm. and have experienced as a participant some tremendous learning programs. If there's one thing pharma did very well was training and development, I, I will say that. And so what I perceive though, is that if the first time you develop that program at an organization, there probably was a heck of a lot more work and effort and buy-in and, and momentum generation and senior leadership involvement of getting a program off the ground the first time, mm -hmm. which helped create the environment where it was so successful. Then to move, you may move, but without doing that additional you know, doing all that upfront work to create that program to start with, right? There's, there's a certain amount of energy that comes from developing something new for the first time versus developing something new for the second time, perhaps. I, I, that's my, just a, 
Yeah. You bring up, I think, an interesting thing. Right? We're talking about the practical things rather right, than the mistakes. The flip side of that, I think, for me, a mistake now it's a practical necessity is understanding what do our executives need and want, and how do they understand what the idea is. Yeah. My my pitch here is that I think we underestimate the amount of time it takes to the term is socialized those new concepts or new programming ideas with all of the key influencers ahead of time. Um, I, have, I have fallen in love absolutely with all of the learning around neuroscience over the last 10 years. And some organizations, if they've been exposed to it, certainly get it. And I don't necessarily have to spend as much time explaining what it is and its power. Other organizations have not. And so I find that I spend my time educating the, the, the benefit, around the benefit of something like neuroscience um, much more than I would have anticipated, but it, and it can seem frustrating in the moment, but is the most practical thing you can do if you're committed to the idea to make sure that it can live. Yeah, perfect. So guys, you've given us tons of jumping off points and I see we've already had a question posed to us there by April. Shane's a keener and got, you know, provided some feedback on it already. That's okay. Well, that's it. We'll get to it because I think it's an important question for the entire group as well. So if you do have questions, folks, or if anything that, you know, in that first section has resonated with you, throw it in the chat. I'm curious to know what you're thinking. But a few things that you touched on that we could double click on, you know, work toward best practices is a phrase that I wrote down, right? And, you know, how do folks on the line find where the best practices exist is a potential area. This whole concept of timing and patience, and, you know, we try to do too much too quickly, I think where I've seen learning fail is where the expectation is the learning is going to result in immediate impacts. Oh yeah. Um, right. So it's, it's how that's more perhaps a, a conversation of expectations. Um, sustainability. I think there's something in there. I think the other piece that, you know, we could look at here is, you know, how has COVID changed how organizations are learning, looking at learning and development. Mm -hmm. But I think another key place to get into so that there's lots there that we can come back to. But I think to maybe put a level set around what are the opportunities that organizations have to create learning opportunities? So, right, say it has a very, you know, say corporate training has a very specific viewpoint around training. It's in the title. But training isn't part, it's just part of all learning and development. And so maybe we could just spend a couple seconds kind of going through what are your learning and development opportunities that we're trying to put into this bracket, bracket of practicality? Does that make sense? Sure. So not everybody all at once. <laughs> um, I think what's interesting to me about what you're asking there, Craig, is, is thinking of it from we talked that we, we've used the word practical, practical, right? And we've used uh, this idea of it being fit for purpose, some of those things. But what I also think we're kind of getting at when we think about this and why you look at your organization to understand where it's at, what the maturity is. Best practice is one of those interesting terms that I would say best practice is best for where you're going to use it. So again, it's that fit it to the organization, right? Um, and that even those best practices may not be the best for Interpipe or Stantec or SAIT. They may be the best for IBM or Google or even Joe's Crab Shack right? It doesn't, it doesn't necessarily mean that only certain things can work for certain sizes of organizations or certain scales, but it is about what's the organization about, right? What, what does it care about? And I think for me, it really comes down to um, practical and how we think about practicality is about how practicable is it? How much can people take whatever it is that you are, you know, performing learning on or giving them new knowledge, skills, abilities, whatever it is, how much should they actually even go do those things? Mm. Because, you know, I think about it, I've, I've kind of specialized for a good number of years in the leadership development area, mm -hmm. um, played in technical training and stuff. But in technical training, it's often a little more to Greg's point of the, we train it, you do it, and we see that link quite easily, right? And so, yeah. Craig, your, your comment about, we don't see the results for a while, that's where it's usually slightly closer tied, right? As long as we're doing it right, and we're not training something, somebody in something that they're not going to use for three years, right? 
but I think in the leadership development space, that's where that lead time or lag between the training and when you see a result from it can be quite protracted because these are habits and behaviors that we are really trying to change. And I think when Greg talks about the neuroscience approach, that can be really a great catch for engineering based organizations or organizations where they're like, I don't necessarily think of it from a psychology perspective, or I don't think of it from a human behavior perspective, but you give me the why the neurochemicals are working the way that they are, and now I can get it, right? That biology lens, maybe that's where you catch the imagination and the attention of your people, right? But it is all about how am I also going to set the organizational culture up to allow people, when we think of things like leadership development, to go and do these things relatively quickly after we talk about them. So if we talk about how do you have good and effective performance conversations, how do you create an environment where that's valued, where taking the time to go and have those performance conversations is seen as something that is important for folks to do? Because you know, good person versus bad system, bad system will win every time. And if the system is saying, nope, don't take time for performance conversations, don't do it, it's not worth our time, but yet you're training people on it because you want to look like you care about these things, right? And so it's being honest with yourself about what is the organization and what do you do there? And then spending your time, and when Greg talked about those, that stakeholder engagement, I'd say I'd go even one level further to that and also about influencing the culture to match the things you're being asked to train folks on or that you're being asked to have learning available on is making sure you're trying to do what you can as a practitioner to set all of your future learners up for the fact that when they learn this thing or when you, you have them practice this skill, it's going to be something that the organization will give them space for. And I think that's a really important part about the practicality is if you're training on something, you know for sure that the senior leadership or the line leaders or the supervisors or whomever is your deal there is actually not gonna let them do the thing that you're training on, that's not practical, right? It just doesn't make sense. Yeah. You had asked a question earlier, Craig, around COVID, post-COVID. Yeah. What does practical learning look like post-COVID? And I was thinking about this, and I think it's accentuating things that were already emerging. Um, and I think on us, the practitioners, is to figure out um, for our organization, right, and each one's going to be a little different, um, how to best leverage that. So what do I mean? Um, I think I've seen, I know I've seen more online. We, where I was, I did a different organization now than I was um, when COVID started and they had very little that was delivered virtually. Most was delivered in person. I don't think they were unique in that respect. COVID comes along, what did we do? Everything had to shift online. And we experimented a little bit over, okay, so how do we do this? Because we know that online sitting in this kind of interaction is great in short amounts. But an eight-hour workshop in this platform would be no. <laughs> so we, that's why we're only here for forty minutes. Right, 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 right. There's just that, that that's a different type of fatigue than when you're in a, a classroom with folks. So um, what that led to for 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 the company I was at the time was uh, more online in smaller amounts, spaced out, so that um, if if we, I mean, we had a workshop typically last two days, all of a sudden now we're doing four half days. Yeah. Right, so the learning hours didn't decrease necessarily. The, the amount of interaction did in terms of the, the number of, of times people would need to set aside to go through that same learning you know, hours, if you will. And I don't like talking about it in that respect, but here's one of the benefits that I now understand through neuroscience, why I thought it was actually more impactful learning is because you're interacting with the material not once in an eight hour window, you're interacting with it four times. And our attention spans cannot be held for eight hours. We all know that. Yeah. But yet we all insist on day-long workshops. So the, by, by spacing it out, uh, it meant that whatever uh, we were teaching and the people who stuck with it ended up with a higher level of retention and application um, than prior in the face-to-face -face days. Um, the downside to that is scheduling conflicts and people's commitments elsewhere, right? You, you really got to be dedicated to go to all four in that example versus yeah. um, saying, well, I can just skip one. Well, can you really? I mean, I'm not going to say never, but it, it, you, you're, you're robbing yourself of that learning opportunity, my belief, yeah. and you're taking away that investment, not the money, well, certainly the money, but also then the investment in your own development, right? Or your team's development. 
So I think those are some, some of the things. Um, and of course, that then lead, led to asynchronous, right? Does it all have to be done at the same time? Yeah. Maybe. Could we challenge ourselves though to pre-record? And I've done that too, where here's the key thing we want you to learn and maybe have a team discussion about. I have a couple of examples I can talk about. But you record the learning so that it can be played back at a different time that's best for them. There's, I think I'm going to add one caveat to my own statement there. I think that for that to work, there needs to be a so what conversation that follows yeah. the independent learning. Yeah. So what am I going to do about this? What, what are you doing about it? What can I do about it? Right. That peer learning and coach to coach or, or face, but however that happens, right. That peer coaching, essentially, if you have that, then you have embedding and that's where the actual learning takes place, right. You're absorbing knowledge to that point. Yeah. But why I say that it's that embedding that where the learning takes place is because that's where you start to reflect. That's where you start to synthesize. Sorry, I can say the word now. And that's where you can start to generate insights. And once you have those insights, that new knowledge, that new connection your brain has just made, that's yours. Yeah. Right? And you can tell I get excited about this stuff. But that's the, that's the stuff that I think is the most impactful of all the things we've talked about is generating those insights so that new connection is yours. You own it. hundred percent. We, and we often talk to our clients about this. It's interesting. You brought up the full day versus half day, you know, a common question that we've gotten over the last little while since we've started to emerge from COVID is we don't have time for a full day or a two day workshop. Can you give us that in two hours? Well, yeah, eight times um, over. Sure. Yeah, exactly. No, we can't, but we could dig into what you think perhaps is most important here and deliver that. Um, yeah, couple intra, a couple interesting quotes here that I love, you know, shame the good person versus bad system. Bad system wins every time. I had to write that down. That that could be a sure. coaster. Uh, I like that one. So um, there are a couple of questions here from folks that I want to get to. So we make sure we answer them. So I'm going to go see if we can kind of bring these together because I think they somewhat could potentially tie. So the first question that April posed was, how do you measure the benefit of training? We have seen cuts to training budgets with the do more with less, give us 14 hours and two, uh, and focus on efficiencies. So that, that's one. And I think it ties very well into the next question of how do you promote or advocate for learning I'm going to rephrase this, I think, to the lower levels of the organization. So it's posed as past the management level during tightening budgets and virtual world. So I'm seeing this question saying the organization is basically just saying we're only going to provide learning or training to managers and above, not down to the lower levels. So I think there's a good argument around how do you pr prove the value of training to perhaps use that to justify or advocate for learning past the management level discuss. Gosh, I have a thousand thoughts already. Um, Shane, if you don't mind, I'd like to, to kick this particular round off. So how do you measure? Oh my gosh. Well, classically, there's this guy called Kirkpatrick, who I don't know if he's still around or not, but he developed long before I came around a method for measuring the impact of learning. And there's exactly, there's four levels. The first level, I'm going to oversimplify, so correct me if I'm wrong, Shane, but the first level essentially says that I learned something, that I enjoyed the day, that I think I learned something. The smile sheets, we'll call them in the learning space, right? Which translates to, back in the days of in-person learning, which translates to how cold was the room and were there cookies? Yeah, exactly. Did I enjoy lunch? Yep. The second one is around, okay, so do I feel I'm going to actually apply this knowledge? I Sure, I got this new knowledge, but okay, what am I going to do with it? Or am I going to apply it? That's the second level. The third level is... Um, do others see me apply the knowledge? Do they see me behave differently? Do they see me use different tools? The fourth level is, can they measure, can, it, can the impact of this new behavior, this new knowledge, the application of be measured, right? So is it sustained? Are others seeing it as well? And I think that's what we're trying for always as a Kirkpatrick level four, right? So it's the impact of learning. If you can get to the impact of learning and be able to quantify that, then you apply some dollars to the hours that you saved or the more productive nature of your work, and then you can start to quantify the impact of learning. It is not quickly arrived at. It can usually take a bit of time to, to do. But here, I, I will tell you a little story. Um, I worked for an oil and gas refinery for a while, and we had a coaching program that was really, really impactful. 
but had a price tag associated to it. And I went to my friends in accounting and said, here's my challenge. Help me prove the value of this, this program and help me understand what the return on investment is. And we were faced with the challenge, as many organizations are, of saving a lot of money over a short period of time. And so we used that challenge to anchor against our thinking. So there it was $100 million. We wanted to save $100 million. Okay. So knowing what the investment is and all the leaders that we've made with the coaching program, if we can say that X percent, and it was a really, really small percent, if X percent of all the decisions made um, you know, could be attributed to, or the cost could be attributed to this coaching investment, what would that look like as an ROI? And it turns out that with their rigor, my numbers and their rigor, we actually could show that for every dollar we spent on the coaching program, that organization saved or made a dollar twenty. No one believed the numbers, so accounting had to run it twice and show the math. But we we were able to win an international coaching federation award that year for having proved the value of that investment. Didn't happen in a week. I got to tell you that, but it it can be done. Um, and, and I understand I have lived those cuts at every organization of where I've worked about learning is well, usually one of the first things to get cut. And I remember hearing one of the phrases that I still use to this day in terms of trying to get people's attention on why this is an investment is, okay, we, we would say, well, what happens if we invest in them and they go on a development program and they leave? My argument is what happens if we don't develop them and they stay? Yeah. Right. Like it, it isn't about development. Why people leave necessarily. It's, it's like lots of other reasons why, but not investing in people is, is certainly, I think a big mistake. And one of the biggest mistakes you can make if you're trying, if people really are first in any organization, development needs to be a part of that conversation. 100%. Thanks for the encouragement, Don. The last Jake, thing I'll say is, oh, is, is right, from a TED talk from years ago. There is a phrase, it's a catchphrase, it's a bit of a story, but the catchphrase is this, creativity begins when you take your budget and remove a zero. Creativity begins when you take your budget and remove a zero, meaning you had a million dollar budget and now recession, cutbacks, merger acquisition, all of a sudden your million dollar budget's $100,000. How do you get the same thing done? Gotta be creative. What do I mean by that? I mean, you need to scale back what it is you think you need, stick to the essentials and go with that. And I find when you challenge yourselves and throw all preconceived notions about how something has to be managed, you can get that creativity going. Go to different partners and do that, do that thought process with them. Try and get someone else's perspective. Well, and I'd agree with you on that, Greg. I think it's about being bold and brave around experimenting, right? Piloting doing things where you can say, okay, well, if I have to build this from popsicle sticks and glue, yeah. right? I mean, I remember my theater school days where that was exactly what we were doing is creating, you know, props and stuff out of whatever we could find, going to Valley Village, going to Goodwill and just cobbling things together because you had no money, right? And, and so I grew up professionally in a world where there was no money, right? So it was always funny to me that I would get into other industries, whether it be energy or, or others. And it was the, the solution to problems was always throw money at them. Mm. right bring in a consultant bring in a partner do all of that like that's one approach but i also think there's some magic in being inspired by the ways that people learn in life right um everything from you know retooling what looks like a trivia night or a board game or whatever it might be to engage people into something and what's fascinating is everybody will always look and go well if, if people are having fun while they're doing it it must not be serious work business right and for me, there's a lot of value in, in understanding and, and helping people to understand, well, this is how human beings learn, right? This is how we, we process things. This is how we internalize either be skill or information or whatever it is. Um, but it's about, it, it doesn't always have to be perfect. And I think perfect is the enemy of good and done in our world, a lot of ways, because we can say, well, we didn't get to take this approach, which we know to be the best, the gold standard, the best practice, as Craig was saying earlier, right? And I think we have to be really, in, in practical terms, as practitioners, able to say, okay, it may not be the perfect way, but it's going to get me there, right? And that resourcefulness, that ability to see many ways to accomplish the same thing, 
I think is such a critical and important piece of being practical in times like this and not giving up because it's very easy to get disheartened. It's very easy to think, oh, well, then the organization doesn't care about learning. Let's recall that those business leaders that are making those choices are having to balance out all these different concerns that they have, right? Whether it's revenue on one side, expenses on another, maybe there's something going on with a major client or a product um, or a, a raw material suddenly tripled in price and nobody expected that. And they're trying to go, well, what do I do here? And I've always found that there's something about meeting those business leaders that are making those choices or saying, you got to cut. Meeting them with the kindness to say, okay, help me understand what we're trying to accomplish, right? By cutting this, where is it going? What is it doing? Be a, be a business person first. You know, those of us that do learning and development in industry versus in, ac in academia, that's what we are, right? We are persons of a business before we're anything else. And so how do we get into those conversations? How do we help under uh, have ourselves understand and help them understand the ecosystem of things that we're working with, right? Because they will see it as just dollars out the door. That's, that's just, it's a line item on a budget. But if you can help engage with them in, well, this is what it looks like. This is what it does. And so if we, if we cut this training element, then these pieces of machine operation or health and safety or whatever it is, put it in terms that they understand um, to say, here's the implication of that. And so it's a, you don't want to cut off your nose to spite your face, right? You don't want to cut all of this and then six months down the road, not have anybody that can operate that particular machine or who can step into your leadership roles. You know, when we talk about succession planning, as an example, we always put it in terms of what's the business risk? Because as practitioners for years and years and years, we did it as, well, we make the binder and the binder has all the names in it and the binder's great, all hail the binder. And then it sits on the shelf. And then two years later, you take it down, you blow the dust off and sneeze and you do it again, right? And that was an exercise that was more for us to feel good about, look, we did that than anything else. Whereas if we see it as how are we mitigating the business risk posed by when an individual or an individual role in the organization has a protracted vacancy, you know, here's what it costs you if let's say your CFO role is vacant for a long time, right? And when you can start to put it in terms that the business understands in its kind of P&L or, or balance sheet perspective, that's when I find the conversation shift. But it's when we come at it as pure practitioners saying, but learning is so important. Learning is why people love coming here, learning this, learning that. Well, no, what is the actual impact of this? If we were in academia, great. That probably carries a lot more weight, Yeah. right? But when you're in industry, it's about whatever your business is about. Yeah, you need to speak the, the language of business. You have to speak their vernacular. Yeah, yeah. yeah for sure. Although it, it, it is interesting, right? Because I think a lot, there's a lot more coming out lately around the importance that employees and future employees are placing on their opportunity to learn and develop when considering where to go, right? So I, I, pre, I, I get it. Hey, it's dollars and cents. If the learning that you're doing isn't necessarily driving results. And Shane, I think we talked about this pre-call around, you know, focus on the essential, not the exhaustive. Um, but there is that piece now where th this opportunity to learn and grow and develop as an individual while I'm employed by you is becoming so much more important. So it, it, interesting time for L&D in, in that way. We've got about five minutes left. So folks on the line, if there's any further questions, comments you want to get in before we have to jump off, please do. Um, I'll throw another question out there that we chatted about ahead of time is... How, when organizations are looking at this, how do you go through the evaluation of when is the right time to build my learning, buy my learning, or partner on my learning? Some quick thoughts on that. <laughs> this is something I've been going on for quite some time, build buyer or, or, or partner. And it has to do with back to the creativity comment, right? Around, um, you know, creativity begins when you cut a zero from your budget. So for me, it's the, the things that if, if a learning idea is so common, let, let's take something like delegation, right? How do I get better at delegating? Is that something that really needs to be developed by an in-house L&D team? Or is there something we could go to market for? 
and re and, and then think about, okay, so if I have an LMD team, if it's just one person, I get there's you know different challenges there. But if you have an LMD team, I challenge us to think about what are the things we can go to market for? A commodity, if you will, right? That we can get from vendor A, B, or C. And say it might be the preferred vendor in that case, right? But what are the things that we can go and shop around and get? Then dedicate that resource in-house to doing things that you need to either do in partnership or for things that are so unique to your organization, it only your in-house LNG team can come up with it. That topic or category of things under that only unique to each organization for me relates to culture more than anything else um, and corporate philosophy around how we want to view different you know, topics related to learning. Um, it has to be so reflective of that place that it is best designed by someone in-house. The partnership is actually, I think, where the blend comes to the, the best practices of both come to be. And that's where I've had a lot of success, actually, is where you find great partners like SAIT. There's a good plug for you, Craig. Great partners like SAIT who understand adult education, who have that breadth of content that's available. And then we come to them and say, hey, but this is our need. Depending on how we would decide we want to roll that out, then usually it's that blended approach where it's their intellectual content. They might be delivering the product, but it's our company logo, our vernacular, our case studies that are in there, right? That way for the end user, for the people learning, it appears to be more uh, of that organization, right? Because they're not having to translate ideas from the way Sate would talk about it to the way that we think about it. That already has been done. When we talk about case studies, they're like, oh, that's Joe. I know Joe. I, I was there. I, you know, that type of recognition, that connection helps make the learning, I think, more um, relevant. Yeah. Excellent. Shane, anything to add on that? Uh, well, I mean, this is, I came from a world where all we could do was build because we couldn't afford to partner or mm. to buy. Uh, and it actually was under Greg's tutelage that I certainly learned and got very steeped in that exactly that approach, right? Is how do you match it to what you need? And, and I would say it goes back to what we were talking about in terms of the sensitivity of your organization to its own vernacular, its own dialect. And if your organization is particularly sensitive to that, then you may even take something that's really common and maybe choose to partner where it's like, we'll take that IP and we're just going to change a few references, right? Maybe we use something, I don't know, they use something, some other term and you use ABCs as an approach, right? And so you spend all this time and you go in and you just tool it so that that's the reference point, right? So that your organization and the people within it have those cultural points to, to, for it to be relevant to them, right? Uh, but I think Greg sums that up well, is that from a practical standpoint, it makes no sense to take the person hours and the effort and energy to truly reinvent wheels that exist out there almost as a commodity. It's like I threw in the chat, the one that always comes to mind for me is, I don't actually think anybody should ever develop their own women's course, because that is, it is a commoditized thing, Yeah. right? It makes no sense. Yeah. Even partnering on that one is a stretch in my mind. Yeah, right? like H2S Alive, same category. 100%, right? It's all those things that make no sense to spend organizational will because there isn't a vernacular benefit there, right? Um, so that's just, I think I would I would agree with it, Greg, 100%. That you, you as a practitioner, if you want to be practical about it, it's, yeah, that might be cash and cash is king and cash is sometimes hard for us to come by in L&D groups. Yeah. Um, but there is a great argument to be made to say, but if we just, if we buy this one, because they're often quite reasonably priced too, uh, here's what we can then spend our time developing and here's the yeah. creative impact to that. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> no, go ahead. There is one more thing I'd like to add to that, that practicality lens. And it's a philosophy, but we can make it really practical, which is where learning actually happens. And I, I think, I, I, I know I grew up in organizations where if, unless you were in a classroom for a week, you weren't learning. And we didn't understand where learning can happen between a coaching relationship between employee and leader or peers or the fact that actually the majority of learning takes place on the job. If you reflect and have and generate those insights, right? It isn't just doing, you have to actually pause and think, how did that go? What might I have done differently? How did I do? That's called the 70-20-10 model, right? Lots of organizations have adopted it. I think the challenge for us is getting people to see the 70%. When people generally say, hey, I wanna go, you know, time for development conversation, Generally, it's I want to go to a conference or here's a workshop. Okay, good. What else? What's the leader role in that relationship and in terms of observing and offering coaching? Not rich enough in my experience. 
and then the 70 percent for for most those of us on the call if we think about it it's really easy to spot because this is our bread and butter we live in this daily for people who don't do our work it is like looking at the invisible and they just cannot see it and oftentimes i feel like we're neil from the matrix where we can see the code written in front of everyone it's like well it's right there why don't you see it well they're not used to looking for it right so until they start understanding how to identify them it's impossible for them sometimes to see so i think for us the opportunity the challenge and opportunity is really around trying to get people to see where that 70 percent lies if we do nothing else the development opportunities in front of us, 70% of it are wasted, right? That's the biggest, the biggest thing we can do. So I get that we're all in resource constraints. I get that. So use your creativity and really focus on that 70%. Love it. Um, it's good. You kind of leaned into the, what I was going to give you as your closing question. And so you, you've, you've somewhat answered it already. And so maybe Shane, I'll come to you on this as we wrap up about, you know, what is, the most practical way to way to approach learning and development. I think for me, there's only it's a singular not... answer, of course, right? What's that? There's only a singular answer to that question, of course, isn't there? Yeah, no, I'm well, joking. Uh, you know, of, of course there is, Craig. I mean, just call Craig. That's the exactly. Oh, that's not. That's not what exactly. I mean. Exactly. <laughs> no, you know what I think. So I'm reminded of, um, you know, Sade and and and. Both Greg and I, we all live in and work here in Calgary or, or area and, and in Southern Alberta. And we've had a lot of rain the last little while, right? And so what it causes me to reflect on is that the biggest way you can be practical is being aware of how saturated your organization is with all of the concerns that it has. Mm -hmm. And learning is one of those concerns. Because if we take an employee-centric view of the people that are in our organization here to serve, we are one of those pie slices coming at them about the things that they need to do to be successful in their jobs. And if we are truly committed to people being better at what they're doing, not just about their learning. And that's what I'll, I'll build on what Greg said about his passion around watching and helping people learn. I think I share that, but I would even extend it one more is I think what we're really passionate about is people getting better at doing the things that they are here to do, right? And if we remember that we're one slice of that, it's you know much like we focus on the rain and you hear people talk about, oh, well, there's flooding risk because the ground's saturated. Right? It's been raining so much that the ground's saturated, so it's all just going to roll off. And I think with us in, in learning development, we have to reflect on that that exists for our people in the organizations, is if they've got so much going on and we try to add more learning on top of that, it's just going to roll off and it's not going to be worth the time, effort, and energy it took. And that's the definition of practicality. Don't waste energy, right? And so I think it's it's being really aware of what are all the things, take, take a walk in somebody else's shoes. We started off this conversation saying, we recognize there's not a lot of diversity visibly in us who are talking to you today. Um, and so in a similar fashion, we wanna empathize with different perspectives. We also wanna empathize with the experience of somebody in our organization and say, okay, so if that's what your day is looking like day to day, then where can we fit into that? Where can we find the opportunities to be really surgical in a way so that we're not just, oh good, learn this and then do this. I think of it in onboarding and new hire training and in annual training. We love more than anything to load stuff in there because legal loves us to do it because it covers our butts. Uh, yeah. Other groups like to do it because it covers their regulatory requirements or their internal policy or procedure requirements, whatever it is. And so we say to these people, okay, go and dip yourself in four and a half hours of various online trainings every year or when you start in the organization. And so usually what results in is business leaders put people in a room for the first day and say, just go through all of this and get her done. So learning becomes a get her done, not a get something from. And, and that's where I think it's really important is just recognizing all of the things that are coming at individuals. Is the ground saturated? And if it is, maybe lighten up and take the opportunity once the ground dries a bit to then come back to it and, and think about it that way because it's about getting the most from what the effort and, and money and time and, and such is that you're inputting to it. Uh, and even the best program can roll off if the ground's saturated. Yeah, well said. Sorry, I had to, I had to chuckle because I think of the compliance training uh, syndrome of you know rapid mouse click to see if you can get through it all and get to the end and actually pass the test on the first go. Yeah. And what, yeah. What, yeah. You know, what HR said was gonna take three hours, now it took 22 minutes. Yeah. And then you get frustrated when you actually have to play the video and you just can't click past it. But True. Anyway, 
that's a conversation for a different day. Uh, gentlemen, thank you so much for your time. We are at, we're a couple of minutes over, but I think it was well worth it. Uh, everybody on the line, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, if we missed any questions in the chat, I will, uh, I will take a look and maybe uh, call on Greg and Shane to give us their thoughts if there's anything we missed. But uh, Shane, Greg, I appreciate you. Thank you so much for making this time work. And uh, we will see everybody very soon. Take care.